All right. Well, hi. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, I was about to say good morning, but I realized while it's morning for me, uh, probably for almost everybody on this, it is afternoon for you. So thanks for being here. Thanks for attending SQL Day. Uh, it's it, just looking at, at the session lineup. It's been an awesome two days and it, and it means a lot that you're here to see mine. Uh, so what we're going to talk about here, and even though I, you know, the the title is a bit cutesy, um, what I want, what I'm hoping people take away from this session is, sure, we're, we're going to talk about some things probably that companies could use and use cognitive services to do some cool things, maybe make some customer experiences better, things like that. But what I really hope you take away from this session is. Uh, the different ways that us as data professionals, which I'm guessing most of us are, kind of the different things we can be involved in that maybe aren't explicitly data. This isn't SQL Server, this isn't Cosmos, anything like that, but it's kind of in the realm of data and we can use data to do some really interesting, cool stuff. And even though the title talks about a company, I'm really hoping there are individual takeaways here that there, there's something that is interesting for you um, and that you take this away and, and kind of experiment with it. And, um, you know, even if it maybe doesn't add value to where you work currently, these sorts of skills in the AI field uh, are, are certainly attractive to other employers as well. So I, I'm not encouraging everybody to instantly go find a new job, uh, but kind of broadening your skill set to things along the edges of data um, can certainly be very helpful. So this is me. This is the title. These are our sponsors. So um, make sure that you've reached out to contact them, even if you're not interested in maybe the product or service that they're selling. Uh, we know this has been such a difficult year for everybody companies, people, all of that, um, at least reach out and say thank you that they're supporting an event that we're all here at, um, even, even though we may be sitting at home. And, you know, make sure that you thank them because obviously what will encourage them the most to come back is buying whatever they're selling. Um, but secondary to that, just that nice personal touch, like, hey, I really enjoyed the event. Thanks for playing a part in it existing. Uh, very, very cool that that they're here to support this. So a little bit about me. Uh, mainly what I want you to take away from this is all the different ways to contact me. And they all kind of have a, a recurring theme. Um, I, I am SQL at speed pretty much everywhere online. So Twitter, LinkedIn, blog is SQL at speed.com. I'll refer to a couple of posts on the blog as we move along here. And email is matt at SQL at speed.com. Uh, I will work for a company headquartered uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, though, as you'll note on this next slide, I am not there. So I know that this is not a past event, but I do want to call your attention to that last line. And, you know, whether it's past, whether it's SQL day, whether it's DPS, um, stay involved in whatever your local data community things are. Um, it, you know, being involved in, in kind of SQL family uh, has certainly changed my life. Uh, and, you know, I always say that the worst case is when you come to an event like this, whether it's virtual or in person, you're going to learn some things you didn't know. Uh, the best case is that you're going to learn some things you didn't know, and you're going to make some sort of networking link that's going to result in maybe a new job for you, maybe a new friend, maybe all of those things. So anything that you attend where the worst case is, um, you know, that you're going to learn something new is a pretty good thing. So like I said, I'm SQL at speed everywhere online, uh, largely an excuse just to show this slide, but occasionally I get to drive race cars. And so um, apologies for that. Let's go ahead and kill teams. It was supposed to have already uh, been killed, but it doesn't always play very nicely. So, and there we go. Very good. Okay. Yeah. So occasionally I get to drive these cars. Obviously COVID has put a bit of a damper on that this year, but if motor racing is, 
is your thing. The only thing I like to talk about more than data and AI stuff is this. So uh, feel free to reach out on that as well. All right, so here's what we're gonna walk through. Uh, we're gonna start, so I'm not sure if everybody here is familiar with what these are. So I always start with kind of the basics of what Azure Cognitive Services are. Um, it's been a bit of a marketing disconnect over the years where you'll see the ads and at least here in the States last year, there was an ad where a young girl sees reindeer out in her yard, takes her surface book out and speaks reindeer to them in theory. And then they talk back and she's able to understand all of that. And that was marketed under Microsoft AI. Cognitive services is what they were showing. So you may have come to this session and say like, well, I know what Microsoft AI is, but what is cognitive services? It's really kind of the guts of that. Microsoft AI is, is the marketing name, uh, but this is what makes it go. And so we're gonna talk about what that is. We're gonna talk about then what the language API is. Um, obviously what I emphasize here is the conversational aspects. And we'll refer to speech, but we're going to spend, like I said, the bulk of the hour in language, because if you understand the ways to talk to the language API, it's very similar how you talk to all the rest of them. And, and speech especially is very, very similar. Um, and also speech doesn't necessarily work all that well in a virtual environment like this, uh, sorting the audio where both I can hear it and, and the audience and all that doesn't always play nice. So language is where we're going to hang out. And then we'll wrap up at the end with, um, you know, it's called what can companies do with this stuff. But like I said, it's really takeaways that I'm hoping something you see here, you're going to think is cool and you want to go play with it more. And if that adds value to where you work, great. And if it adds value to, to the next place you work, also great. And if it's just fun, that's that's cool too. Um, I, I will, I do encourage questions throughout. I'll probably take three or four very short breaks just to kind of ask for those. Um, the, the way this is laid out, I can't necessarily see the chat and Q&A, but we do have a moderator here that's going to help sort that for me. So if there's anything you want to know more about, um, just throw it in the Q&A panel or in chat, and we will get to that as we go. So what is Azure Cognitive Services? Well, like I said, it's the guts of what Microsoft kind of markets as Microsoft AI. Um, what does that mean? So it's a set of a APIs. So if you're a data person, you're not a developer at all, uh, please don't be scared. We're going to talk about a bunch of ways to interact with these where you don't have to write any code at all. But it's a set of APIs that you talk to through a variety of ways. Um, you'll note, so anything I've got in quotes over the next few slides is the Microsoft description of what this is. And I've used them because I think uh, in, in some of these, it's actually very helpful. So they describe it as sets of machine learning algorithms to solve problems in the field of AI. Very vague, right? I think purposefully vague, because when I started working on these just a tad over three years ago now, they were much less powerful than they are now. And that description really hasn't changed. So there's there's things you can tackle and things you can do uh, where um, you couldn't three years ago. And I think they're always going to leave it this vague because they're always coming up with some very cool stuff. Uh, what's what's the layman's term for it? So it's basically other code you can call with code or bots or whatever. And, and we're going to talk about all the different ways to do that, to do things with language. How do you use them? So again, if you're sitting here and, and you're a dev or you have some app dev skills, um, these can be consumed via standard REST calls. Actually, the last demo that we'll get to, I I do exactly that. Um, I did actually write some C-sharp code that builds and, and works, uh, but you don't have to do that. So you can engage with these via logic apps, which is a very low code way to do it. Q&A maker, which is no code. And we'll look at both of those and a couple other things as well. So there's really ways to consume these and however you're technically comfortable, all the way from, I wanna drag some things around on a screen and talk to this stuff to, I want to do that, but I want to write a little code to kind of enhance the way it works. 
to I want to write all the code and that's the only way that I want to talk to it. And, and over this next 50 minutes or so, we're going to walk through all of those things. And hopefully, like I said, you find something in there, you're like, that's cool. I want to take that away and do more with it. And that's part of the reason my contact information is, is both at, at the start and end because I'm happy to help with that and kind of talk you through it. And uh, especially if you're brand new to it, um, some of the terminology and, and names and stuff around all this can be tricky. So I'm happy to help with all of that. But if you don't want to talk to me, uh, the documentation for this is actually fantastic. And that's not a thing I ever thought I'd say where, hey, the documentation that Microsoft put together on this is really helpful and great. But in this case, it is. Um, so the last demo that I'll show you, its baseline is actually what they call a uh, quick start that I pulled out of the docs. So not only is the documentation very thorough, like every parameter of every call, it's going to, there are usually pretty good descriptions of what that is and how you'd use it and why and all those sorts of things. Beyond that, uh, there are examples for tons of this stuff. And it's not just, well, this API call in a line of C sharp looks like this. It's, you know, here's an example where uh, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and they walk you through all the code to do that and, and you know, everything you need to do to get that up and running. So if you walk away from this and you're like, well, nothing Matt showed was really all that cool, uh, but this stuff sounds cool. I want to go find something else. There's tons of examples that they have out there where you can do just that. And the link is in my slides. And also if you just bingle foo uh, Azure Cognitive Services language, it'll take you right to that page as well. So. So what's the list? Uh, as of when I put together these slides uh, for this a few days ago, this list is still true. They have changed the branding on these over the years. Um, so I'll just kind of lightly go over what these are. If language isn't quite your thing, we've got four other uh, APIs we can talk to. So vision, you may have seen that. Uh, there's lots of cool stuff you can do with that. So that's where you've seen, sometimes they'll try to pull like a uh, sentiment analysis out of an image, you know, somebody in a photo or video is happy, they're sad, they're excited, whatever. So it can do some of that. It can analyze images for changes as well. So like flood walls around a, a lake or, or a river or something like that. If there's a state change where the water is much higher on the wall than it has been, then it could trigger some sort of a thing says, hey, you need to go look at this there's about to be a flood here, uh, all those sorts of things. Speech and language, very, very similar. So almost everything I talk about in language, uh, with the exception of some of the disambiguation stuff that we get to, speech will do an audio version of that. So like I said, speech in this medium maybe is not great, uh, it, but everything I show you in language, there's going to be a corresponding speech call that's actually pretty similar to that. Uh, there's also decision, which is basically an enhanced search for like academic research and things like that. Um, I, I, I would imagine there's certainly been an uptick in its use this year because a lot of people are obviously combing online for medical research, vaccine stuff, things like that. Um, and then there's web search as well, which you've, if you've gone to a bot session, I would say in the last year or two, web search seems to be one of the things that the Microsoft personnel like like to show where you talk to a bot and it performs the web searches for you. Today's focus though will be on language stuff. And so, it, you know, I'm calling it a one big API, uh, but one thing you'll notice, and actually as we kind of dive into the first thing, I will talk about it. These APIs can talk to each other and can be combined to do different very powerful things. Um, but I like to focus on language because it's kind of where all the communication starts, especially when you're online. You're probably driving something off a piece of text that your website or your bot or whatever consumed. Um, and one thing you'll also hear me say several times after this is, and when we get to the end, this will be clear. So I don't want to start out with like a heavy breakdown of here's the JSON payload for this call. But a lot of the stuff, almost all of it, talks under the covers via JSON back and forth. And actually, the demo at, at, at the end is going to show us how we can 
it's pretty easily human readable anyway, but I'm going to show you how we can kind of deconstruct that and really understand what we're sending and then what goes back. And hopefully we can get all that done in, in the next little bit. So what is the language API where we're going to spend most of our time here? So what does Microsoft say? They say something very marketing-y, but again, I kind of like it. So I've shared it here. Um, they say that it increases your application's ability to read, comprehend, and enrich written text. So that sounds great, right? But it's also vague. So there's a lot of room under that for all the stuff that it does. So what do I say it does? Really what it does, it helps us and helps our apps, our websites, all those sorts of things. Uh, talk better with customers, users, and people that might turn into one or both of, of those things. Um, you know, so we want we want everybody's experience to be good. We want them, if they've come to our website to buy a product or for help or something like that, we want that to be a positive experience for them to get what they needed out of that. So whenever they have that need again, they'll come back to our, our site or our app. Um, I've been calling it the language API, which is what Microsoft calls it. Is it just one monolithic thing? Not really. And, and you'll see that when we get to the heavy code part at, at the end, you'll, you'll see we're kind of calling one specific thing um, when there's lots and lots of things we could actually be calling. All right, so we've kind of talked through what the marketing angle is here and, and maybe TV ads where we've seen it and stuff like that, but what can we actually do with it? Uh, so what we can do with it is a handful of things. Oh, sorry about that. So the first thing I want to talk about, and that'll be on, on the next slide, is uh, you, you see in some of the marketing stuff around Microsoft AI now that they talk about things called AI for good. And there are some very positive things they're doing there to remove biases from data sets and things like that. Um, a lot of that kind of isn't easily consumed in marketing friendly terms. Um, but one of the things that I would argue kind of falls under this is the next thing that I'm going to show you. And basically what immersive reader does is enrich the, the reading experience for people from a variety of different language backgrounds, uh, language challenges, vision challenges, things like that. And we'll go over what that is on, on the next slide. Uh, from there, we're going to get into a couple things that you've probably spoken to one or both of these via a chat bot on a site. And I'm going to kind of quickly compare and contrast what Q&A Maker does versus what L Luis does. Uh, they're similar but different, and I would say very different in terms of their power, but also in terms of how much effort it takes to set them up. Text analytics for me is what got me into this. And so we'll get to that and we'll just touch on some of the highlights of, of what it does. And, and I'll show you demos throughout all of these. And then we'll end with translator text, uh, which I, I just think is really cool. I think all this stuff is cool. Hopefully that comes through. Translator text is really, really cool. So we'll end and that'll be the code heaviest demo there. So if you're kind of watching these first few and it's like, well, he's just moving stuff around or he's just clicked the thing, where's the code? The code comes at, at the end because I don't want to scare it. Everybody off up front, right? So let's dive into these five things then. So what can I do with Immersive Reader? This is the last marketing speak that you're going to hear from me here, but I really like this because I think it best describes what this does. So it helps emerging readers, language learners, and people with learning differences absorb the written content on your site or in your app. Now, normally this session is 75 minutes long. Obviously that's, that's not the time we have here. Uh, and I would show a demo here. Uh, and actually I, I have the video on my site if you'd like to see that. Uh, so if you go to sequelatespeed.com slash resources, there's a video of what this looks like. You can also just go to this on the Microsoft site and they have a very easy demo to play with. You can type some text in and then it'll take you into the immersive reader experience and you can see examples of everything I'm 
I'm going to show here. So just for the interest of time, I'm going to talk through this. Uh, but if you're, especially if you're in the field of education or something like that, some of what this does is really, really cool. Very, very helpful. Uh, so I would encourage you to go check that out if this is in your field of interest. So what are some of the things it can do? Uh, basically, what it's doing is, is trying to make sure that, like I said, people from different language backgrounds, educational backgrounds may be facing challenges with vision, learning differences, things like that. Make sure that they are able to consume the written content in your app or on your site. So it can do things like change the viewable size of the text. It can display tooltip pictures of commonly used words. So I I would encourage you if you go to this demo and play with it, you know, try to throw some kind of regular everyday words in there. And as immersive reader handles that, you'll be able to, you know, hold your mouse over those and, and see that you've said apple or cow or horse or, you know, th things like that. Um, it can highlight the nouns and the verbs in a sentence as well. So if somebody maybe is learning a language and trying to understand the grammar, sentence structure, things like that, um, it can it can help their learning experience that way. So obviously that's not so much a customer facing thing, but for somebody trying to learn a language, very important. It can read the content out loud. And that's, you know, thinking back a few slides ago where I said uh, that these APIs can play with each other. That's an example there where it's reading the content out loud using the speech API to do that, even though we're in a language API function and something when you go to the site, it says the language API does this, but it's actually using the speech API to do parts of it. Um, it can display the syllables of words as well. So if you're trying to teach like pronunciation and things like that, um, it, it can be helpful there. And it uses the translator API that we'll look at at the end to translate the content into and out of another language as well. So let's say I'm an English speaker, but I'm trying to learn German. Um, it's, you know, that provides you kind of an easy way to switch back and forth and, and understand, you know, what the English word is, what the, what the German word is, or, or any language. Uh, we'll talk about this at the end, but the translator API handles over 60 languages translation wise. So um, pretty powerful there. And, and it's cool to see how even the individual things here use, um, use other APIs and things like that to do some cool stuff. So that is immersive reader, like I said, especially if you're in the field of education or something like that, strongly encourage you to check that out. Uh, very, very cool. Luis, so we're stepping away from education and arguably stepping away from like the AI for good stuff. Um, you can still do very good stuff with this, but for me, immersive reader is is very altruistic. Like it's just there to help. The rest of this stuff can certainly be used for help, but can also be used to make your company more money or make you more money. You know, you're making friendlier, smarter apps. You're making friendlier, smarter websites, things like that. So, yeah. And obviously going back to me saying how good the documentation is, that's not an altruistic thing from Microsoft either. They want these things to be easy to consume. They're built on a, on a consumption model. So the more you play with it, the more money Microsoft makes. So the focus kind of for the rest of this will be a bit on, you know, how you can make a customer experience better. And obviously you would hope that leads to more money for whatever it is you're doing. So Luis is where we're going to start. Um, and then we'll go into Q&A maker after that. And these are very similar. And I get feedback sometimes on this session that I do them in, in the wrong order. And I know that, and there's a reason for that. And hopefully it becomes clear after the next <laughs> few slides and few demos as well. So LUIS actually stands for the Language Understanding Intelligent Service. Uh, that doesn't really roll off the tongue. So we go with, with the acronym instead. So what can it do? First of all, you've probably interacted with this. So if you've gone to a site, and I see more and more of these all, all the time because this technology is so easy to weave into stuff. Um, if you go to a site and there's a very helpful, perky person that pops up at, at the bottom and says, I am here to help, or I'm here to chat, how can I help you? Odds are you're talking to something like this, uh, and it may even be this. 
And so what this is, is this is the most conversational aspect of anything that I'm going to show you. Um, because what it, what it does is it's aiming to reproduce a conversation with a person. Now you have to put a fair amount of work in there to do that. And unfortunately in an hour, this really deserves its own session. And my friend, uh, Sam Nasser from Ohio. So he's, he's one state north of me here in the States, uh, has a session that's all on this. He's at S-A-M-N-A-S-R on Twitter. Um, highly recommend that if you think this is cool, but you'd really like a deep dive session on its own. I'm fairly certain that's been recorded somewhere and is on YouTube. Uh, but Sam does a great one hour session on just this. And uh, it, this it definitely deserves its own hour, maybe its own day. So what are the things it does? How does it make that conversation happen? So it determines the intent of the statement that it gets. And we're going to look at a demo here afterwards where this hopefully becomes clear. Um, so if you say, you know, I want to buy a thing or I want to take a trip, not that we're taking lots of trips right now, um, it determines that intent and says, ah, this person is asking me to do this. And then it tries to isolate the entities in that statement as well. So it may say, I want to buy a pizza. Um, I want to take a trip to Canada. And then says, ah, the entities are, you know, Canada, pizza, something like that. And what you do is you build ML models where it's, it's, it's trained responses come back off of that. Um, these are all JSON objects. Like I said, um, this is typically what's under a chat bot. And what's cool, what I'm going to try to show you very quickly is it provides pre-built models and you can create custom models as, as well. Uh, and there's two different ways to build an app using this. So you can talk to it in a full code way using API calls and all those sorts of things. You can also talk to it via the Luis portal. So let's have a look at that. And while I while I switch over, are there any questions? Okay. No questions at the moment. Okay, there we go, that's better. Okay, um, all right, so I've intentionally not signed in to what this portal does, because I want you, I, they do a good job showing some of the basics first. So if you want to use the portal experience, you just simply go to luis.ai, and it's going to take you, uh, if you don't already have an account, to this. And hopefully this will kind of bring to life what what the slide says. So we're not going to do the flight booking one because most of us are not flying right now. Let's do this. And so, like I said, let's say you own a pizza restaurant and you want, um, you know, it, it can be expensive to have a bunch of people answering the phone. Your restaurant's very busy. You'd prefer people aren't on the phone and they're making pizzas and, and doing all those sorts of things. So you'd like to build yourself a chat bot to take these orders. And so you, let's say you've built a bot and the statement comes in over the bot and says this, order me two pizzas. So what Luis will do is basically predict the intent it thinks you're trying to do. And those intents, like I said, can come from pre-built models or custom models. And we'll take a brief look at those after this. Uh, so it knows, so the intents that are built in the kind of this demo -y front page thing are food order, none, location finder, reminder, book flight. So it predicts based on that statement that you're trying to order food. And there's, there's a high degree of confidence in that. So the score is very high. So I said it pulls intents out and it's done its best effort there. And it pulls entities out as well. And so that can be things like the object, things like the number of that object. Uh, and so you'll see here where entities within the JSON, their food type, it knows that you've asked for a pizza, which is good because it's a pizza restaurant, and that you've asked for two. And so what would follow on from here then based on, on the model you've built is, you know, it would ask you things like, what would you like on 
on the pizza and you'll answer back and you'll say, I would like cheese. I would like pepperoni, sausage, whatever it may be. And then there will be uh, kind of prompts built in af after that, uh, that, that kind of show you how that works. And so what I want to show you briefly here is um, let's look at some, a couple of custom models that I've built. So let's get the recommendations out of the way. We don't need those. So this is this is uh, a chat app that's not fully featured because it's basically built at, as an example for this. But this is something you could lay a chat bot over the top of. Um, and what this does is it uses the pre-built model for restaurant reservations. And so you'll see we've come to our intents here and we can do things like make a reservation, change it, find it, um, those sorts of things. And so what might examples of that be? So we've gone in here and you'll see, and you can add things here and you can retrain the model and all that. Pretty user-friendly to build it this way. Um, you'll see that it's pulling things like entities out of this. So this is a statement that, that this is pre-built, so it did not come to it through a bot or any other sort of interaction. It, it was already here, but this is somebody saying we need to go later, like a quarter to seven change time. So they're speaking to their phone or something like that. So it understands, well, this is a time. And you'll see here like place name. So it knows that that's a restaurant. Uh, there's one down here that I always get a kick out of. So it says we need to get a hold of KFC to switch that reservation time. Speaking as a Kentucky re uh, resident, reservations are usually not required at KFC. But anyway, you can kind of see how that works here. And then let's go through the entities. And this is something that I want to highlight before we take kind of a quick glance at the pre-built models as well. And so you'll see there's two types here. There's ML and there's a list. So let's look at list first. So meal type is a list. That means basically it was hand entered. Um, like it says, it's a fixed closed set of words and they're extracted by an exact text match. So some of this, if you're like, oh, I think it's just matching on what the person said, that's absolutely true. It is. Um, so th this is exactly what you'd think, right? Meal types, breakfast, dinner, lunch, supper. You could add synonyms in here, like maybe your restaurant markets itself as a brunch restaurant, but you know a lot of people come for the for the breakfast food. So you could put brunch in here, then your bot's gonna be a little smarter. If somebody asks for breakfast, that's what they're gonna get. Um, and so let's go back, let's see, uh, I'll go back to entities. So we've gone over what a list is, basically pre-built, like typically hand entered um, list of things. What's a machine learn list? And so what that comes from is basically things that it has received and based on the machine learning magic happening here, it knows that the cuisine type falls at certain places in sentence. It's kind of using, it, to use a layman's term, it's using context clues to figure this out. And also using as you train your model and things like that, it's using kind of your cues as well to do that. So you can see like sushi, that's gonna be a cuisine type. Tacos, things like that. So maybe you've seen this and you're like, okay, um, I don't want to build my own. I see they've got a restaurant reservation, but I don't run a restaurant. I want to do something else. So here's all the pre-built domains they have that, that, that you can add to your account here. Um, lots of the basics, calendar, email, home automation. So like smart home type things, uh, talking to something to turn, turn your lights off, put your blinds up, things like that. You can see I've added restaurant reservation to mine for examples. And, uh, utilities, weather, web, those sorts of things. Um, yeah, so let's go. Okay, so we'll go from there and let's go back to the slides. And let me know if you have any questions about that. Like I said, this is very much technology that deserves its own hour. Um, so just giving it 10 minutes or so hardly seems fair, but hopefully you kind of ha have a picture of, of what that is. Uh, and hopefully the slides will start playing here. Okay. Very good, very good. Okay, so what can I do with Q&A Maker? So you'll note, I, I said, I, some people say I, I do these in 
in the wrong order, but I do it intentionally. So Luis, as you probably got a picture of there, can be very complicated. You can build very powerful kind of conversation flows. Um, you can build lots of entities, lots of intents and make a really nice conversational experience. But you're investing a lot of time and effort to do that. Maybe you don't want to. Maybe you just want something on a site where I just want to go to a site and I know uh, from, let's say, people calling on, on the phone and things like that, they're going to ask me one of 20 questions. And I want to give them that chatbot experience, but I don't want to have to do a lot of programming or I don't want to have to spend a lot of time in that portal to build it. How can I do that quickly? Q&A maker is your answer there. Uh, and where Luis is very smart and you can constantly train and retrain that model uh, to, to increase the quality of that, of that experience, Q&A Maker is not as smart. Um, its flexibility basically comes from the information you give it, not how you implement it and the entities and intents that you define and things like that. It does all that for you. It is very simply a question and answer bot. You can add some conversational flows in, but it is um, it, it is what it says it is. So it does serve information interactively. It's driven off what they call knowledge bases. And those can be anything. They can be websites. They can be tab separated values files. They can be Excel sheets. They can be PDFs. They can be Word documents. They can be hand entered, all those sorts of things. So let's have a look at what those look like. All right, so what we've got here, so I've signed into Q&A maker.ai and what I've done here is a demo I set up. So as you may have noticed from the first slides, motor racing is, is a passion of mine. And I kind of set up this imaginary example that let's say my wife is online looking for a very exciting gift for me. Um, she thinks that I've been very, very nice this year and she would like to buy me a nice gift. She knows I like to race cars. And so she went online and looked at places where I could spend the day driving exotic fast cars. And she encountered a site. And let's actually go to that site. Um, so she encountered a site and I, I cannot tell you if this place is any good or not. It merely served as a very helpful example for this. Um, so she encounters this site, goes and, you know, let's say pre-bought, goes to, to the FAQ page, clicks through here, all those sorts of things. This isn't maybe a great experience, right? You've just, you've got to find the link and you've got to find the question that matches yours and you, you can't use natural language to talk to it. Um, but let's say we built something where we could. So that's where Q&A Maker comes in. And so let's go ahead and let's actually create one. Um, so I'll kind of walk you through this because it does take, I would say about five minutes. So uh, it certainly doesn't fit in this hour. Um, so what we've got here is there's five steps. So you create a Q&A service um, and that's pretty simple there. You click that link, it's gonna walk you through the steps to provision that resource in Azure. You're gonna connect that service to your knowledge base. So you're gonna define the knowledge base after this, but it does basic things like, you know, what's your account in Azure? What's the subscription name underneath that? What's the service? That's gonna be the thing you made in step one. And then also what's, what's the language? So you'll see here where it says, this will do chit chat at, and extraction. So basically means it can talk back and forth in that and extract the data as well. And then for some of these, it can extract the data out of the document you send, but the conversational aspect is very limited within this service. So that doesn't go for translator, which we'll end with, but it does go for here. So we've got that and then we name our knowledge base and then we populate it. So let's say what the racing place did is they took this address here and they popped it in there. And it does all the work after that. And you can also upload files here. You can give your bot a bit of personality as well. Um, you can select that here. And then step five, you actually click the button. And about five minutes later, you have uh, exactly what you would expect to have. And so let's have a look at kind of walking through what that knowledge base actually looks like. So I've done all that. I've obviously pre-baked this. 
And so you'll see just by pointing it at that link, I have question and answer pairs. And I can also add alternative phrasing, follow-up prompts, things like that. So maybe, uh, you know, instead of a guest or a customer to the site asking me, is there a limit on speed? They're saying, are there speed limits? So I can add that alternative phrasing to drive them to this answer. Um, and that's something, you know, odds are people are interacting with this, with a bot overlay and you'd be logging what they're asking it. And then that's how you can kind of enhance this. But again, it's by hand. Luis, we can make smarter. You know, there is the ability to kind of save and train here because like under underneath it's kind of similar. Um, but again, this doesn't, I, I would say, have kind of the intelligence and flexibility that Luis does. So let's have a look at what talking to this bot looks like. And so what I've got up here is Q&A bot. And this is just a web app bot within Azure. And we're going to do the test in web chat. Now, a fair warning, sometimes this doesn't play nice. Um, it, is, it is very much a test rig. And uh, sometimes this just does not work. So you'll see. All right. So hello and welcome. That's often a good sign once it has prompted. So I asked, what is the speed limit? And what this is, is a web app bot that I've laid over that knowledge base that I just showed you. And here in a second or two, odds are, I'm going to get an answer back. So that's good. So we're talking to the knowledge base that I just showed you. So let me show you where, in my opinion, Q&A Maker kind of lets us down, where Luis would not. So I ask, can I bring guests? Yes, guests are free to join. Great. But let's say maybe that's not what my customers ask. They say, can I bring other people? It gives me what I would say is the wrong answer. So it's kind of used the context clue of other, and it's matched it to an answer that says other, but it's not really what I asked. I just want to ask if I could bring my friends. Um, I didn't ask if they could ride in, in the cars. And so that's where, Luis, you can kind of train that out of it. Um, Q&A maker, you're limited with what you can do. But again, it's very easy to set up. If you had watched me do this start to finish, it takes, I, I think when I set this demo up uh, earlier in, in the year, it took me about 10 minutes. So this stuff's really fun to play with. And you may wonder, like, obviously, you're not going to send a customer off to the Azure portal to talk to this. Um, there's a link here in channels where you can go and you can click get bot embed codes and it's going to give you an iframe bit of html code to embed that on your site i am the world's worst web designer for for sure but i know what an iframe is and i know how to put that in a site so they make this really easy to create and talk to and all that stuff and it's for me lots and lots of fun to talk about so any questions about that before we uh jump into the next bit of slides Okay, text analytics. So this one is lots of fun for me. Unfortunately, we don't have time for it. Um, if you go to my blog at sqlatspeed.com and uh, search for men in blazers, you're gonna find two articles. And that's that, That's a football podcast here in, in the States. The one article is gonna be the story of how listening to a silly podcast about sports got me into playing with this stuff. The other article is going to be a deep dive uh, in exactly how I set up the demo that you're going to see at the end of this slide. So like I said, with this normally being a 75 minute session, had to cut a couple things for time. But if you're interested in a really deep dive of, of how I set up the demo that comes after this, definitely uh, check that out. Like I said, you can go to my site and search men and blazers or deep dive. But text analytics. So what does this do? So it does a bunch of stuff. It does lots of cool stuff we don't have time to talk about or show everything it does. But I want to hit some of the highlights probably that you've seen and you just didn't know maybe what it was called. And so key phrase extraction is the first thing that I want to do. So if you go to let's say like Yelp or any sort of restaurant review site or something like that, or you've seen any sort of word cloud visual, whether it's Power BI or something else, and key phrase extraction is one of the technologies powering all of those. So let's say you go to a restaurant review site and it says excellent pasta, uh, great sauce, good wine, whatever. It's doing key phrase extraction from all the reviews that have 
been submitted and kind of pulling out the most commonly used, what it sees. Uh, so it, it can be used for that. It can also be used, and we'll talk about this at the end, to um, pull key phrases out. So let's say like you work for a software company, you've released a new version of a product and you have a support forum. You can turn text analytics use loose on that and do key phrase extraction of new posts. And if and then you can put sentiment analysis, which we'll talk about here in a minute over the top of those. And if the key phrases that are being pulled out are very negative, you have customers that are very unhappy and probably want to go react to that. But at the end of the day, key phrase extraction does exactly what it says it does. It extracts the key or most commonly used phrases out of the text that you've pointed it to. Uh, text analytics can do language detection as, as well, exactly what it sounds like. I feed it a piece of text and it says, you know, with a confidence score of 0.98, that is Polish, that is English, whatever. Uh, named entity recognition is a bit trickier. And so there's, it that is what it says it is in that it will highlight entities such as like ranges of time, currency, people, places. So if you've gone to a website and you see those kind of automated hyperlinks to, um, you know, if it refers to a place and it connects you to their, to the website for their tourism bureau or some, something like that, named entity recognition is making that go. So that would be something called entity linking. And this, this gets confusing, e even the way they've documented, this is the one part I think where the documents fall down. So named entity recognition is like the name of the feature and it does the thing you would think and it does entity linking to kind of drive engagement with your site and all those sorts of things. But it also does, and if you read the docs, it basically says this, named entity recognition does named entity recognition under the covers, which doesn't make a lot of sense. What does that mean? So it means it's disambiguating the thing. So let's say it sees a piece of text and somebody's talking about Venus. Is it the planet? Is it the goddess? And so it's using ML and context clues for, in layman's terms to disambiguate that and say, based on the sentences around this, I know it's the planet. So if we're using entity linking here as well, I'm gonna link you to an article on, on the planet as opposed to the goddess. And then last but not least is sentiment analysis. So what that is, is very simply, it scores the sentiment of a piece of text that you feed it. And it returns a score. Now, subsequent versions to when I started working with it three years ago have enhanced this. But at the end of the day, it still does this very simple thing where it gives you a score from zero to one, zero being very negative, one being very positive. In my experience, you'll never see one, you'll never see zero, you'll see decimals that are very close to it. And it returns a number, I think that's like 14 decimal places long. So it's very precise <laughs> on a subjective thing. Um, but yeah, it's analyzing the sentiment of that text. So, you know, let's say your company, somebody sends an email to customer support at mycompany.com and they're very angry. They bought a, a thing that you make and they think it's, a, it's really bad and they want you to know about that. If you have sentiment analysis turned on, you don't necessarily have to have somebody reading that. You can actually flag an event and say, listen, if there's a sentiment score of an email below this, things can happen after this. It sends an email to somebody to contact this person, or it triggers an Azure function to contact that person back or automatically send them a gift card, or whatever it may be. So let's take a brief look at what sentiment analysis looks like in action. And while it's trying to pull the demo up, uh, are there any questions? Okay, if not, uh, since we've only got about 10 minutes left, I'll dive right into it. So what logic apps are, and I wish I can make a session just on these because they're so cool. Uh, Azure logic apps, I would argue, are heavily under-marketed for as powerful as, as they are. Uh, what, what I describe them as is they're event-driven workflow containers. And it's not container in the Kubernetes or Docker sense, it's container in like in like a, a bowl sense. 
um, it contains a workflow. And what event driven means is there's a triggering event that happens. So for example, here, I've chosen the trigger of when a new tweet is posted. Uh, but it can be this, there's 300 plus first party connectors now. So you can tie it into SAP, tie it into ServiceNow, tie it into any number of things and drive any workflow off this. I can send an email from here. I can trigger an Azure function. I can open a ticket. I can insert data in the Azure SQL DB. I can stream data to Power BI. Any or all of those things connected to basically like 300 plus apps. Super flexible. Don't have to write a line of code to do it. Very cool stuff. But this session isn't about logic apps, uh, but I definitely encourage you to play with them. So what did I do here? So what I did here is actually the thing I built for the podcast that I referenced earlier is we would take tweets from the top flight English clubs. So you take tweets from, from users at those handles and then run sentiment analysis against them to see how their supporters felt about the club. And, uh, and then we would rank those and they would talk about it on on the podcast. Um, but what I did here is so, and I've obviously pre-provisioned all of this. Like I said, if you go to sqlatspeed.com, search for deep dive, you'll see in, in all the detail I could muster exactly how I did this. Lots of screenshots, all that stuff. Uh, it would be a really boring demo if I did that here. So I'm not going to do that. Um, so what I've done here is this. So I have the Twitter connector in my logic app and the event I want to drive off of is when a new tweet is posted. And how that works is you give it search text. And so this, like the tooltip there says, it can be a phrase, you would put a phrase in quotes, it, it could be a hashtag, it could be you're only monitoring tweets from a certain handle, so you'd put that there, you know, love, hate, dog, pie, whatever. Um, and then you tell it how often you want to check for items. Uh, word to the wise, as I was monitoring, you know, worldwide famous clubs, um, this counter doesn't work the way you think. So right here, it says, how often do you want to check for items? I've set it for a minute. So you think every minute this logic app wakes up, says, are there tweets about dogs? Yes, there are. Okay, I'm going to do all this stuff afterwards. And then it goes to sleep for a minute. That's not what happens. If So it basically spins up different iterations of itself. So it's kind of a serverless stateless thing. Um, but if, if there's still a logic app running, the counter never starts. So if you're monitoring like Chelsea football club or something like that, where there's people tweeting constantly about it all around the world, all different time zones, this counter never resets. Uh, there's a story on my blog of how I used Azure Scheduler, which sadly is no longer there to do that. Um, but I, if you want to talk more offline about how you can kind of cost control these, don't have time here, but it's very important because the first weekend I ran the table for the podcast, I spent uh, roughly $700 learning what I've just shared with you that you need to cost control these things. And this counter doesn't work if there's if the tweets never stop. But anyhow, so we're doing search text. We're saying every minute I've connected it to my personal account here. Then I've pre-provisioned a Cognitive Services text analytics resource. I've come here, I've gone insert a new step and I've done the detect sentiment action. And what that does is you just add that step. You say, I wanna add Cognitive Services, the detect sentiment action. Then you tell it all this takes is what's the text that I'm going to sentiment score for you? Well, how does tweet text get in there? seems easy, right? kind of is. So what it does when you highlight that field, it gives you uh, what they call dynamic content, which is everything from the data set that when a new tweet is posted, it ingests that tweet, it breaks down stuff like the person that tweeted it, their number of followers, their location, just tons and tons and tons of stuff here. But it also gives you the tweet text. So I pulled that in here. And then from there, actually did, I added two steps. So you can run things in parallel if you want. Um, the Power BI workspace this is connected to, unfortunately, no longer works. So that that's why that warning's there. But this did used to connect to a streaming data set and we could do kind of a live dashboard of supporter sentiment and things like that. What it also does is it inserts a row into an Azure SQL database that I have, and you'll see this dynamic content is here again. So you connect to a database, whether in Azure or, or on-prem actually, though that's a little 
trickier to do. And then you add all this dynamic content from, from the data set, from the event that we're looking for, and it stores it in the database. And you can then query off of that and things like that. That is how sentiment analysis with logic apps works. Again, that's quicker than I usually go through this because this is usually a longer session. Hopefully you got a picture and flavor of what that is. Um, if not, I invite you to either go to the site or just ask me. I, I love to talk about this stuff, it's so cool. Uh, so let's get back to the last handful of slides here and let's wrap up with translation because translation is really cool. So what can you do with it? Well, pretty obvious, you can translate text and that uses um, the majority of the languages are translated using NMT, which is neural machine translation. So it's using a neural network to do that. Performance is better, precision is better, all those sorts of things. You'll also see there are some languages that are translated using SMT, which is the which is statistical machine translation. That is a slower, less precise way to do it. And if you go to the documentation page, they always update that with what is using NMT versus SMT. Both are fairly precise. The NMT ones, again, are better. You can transliterate text as well. So you can convert it from one alphabet to another. So let's say I'm translating from English to Hindi. Um, you could do that here and, and it's very simple. And I'll actually show you in, in the code how you can do just that. You can detect language as well. Like you'd think you can look up word translations for chunks of text, all those sorts of things. Again, we're strictly speaking text here. Um, the speech service does speech translation and all those sorts of things. And, and there's, there's a way to kind of wire these up together, but we're strictly speaking text, though the speech translation stuff's amazingly cool. I, I, I wish I could show that to you. So translator seems pretty basic, right? Let's have a quick look at an app that I wrote that does just that. All right, so we've got this here. Okay, so this is a C-sharp app that I wrote. We'll do .NET run translation demo. And I say, thank you for having me at SQL day. And what we get is the raw JSON objects here. So it's basically an array of stuff that comes back. I sent an API call that said, basically translate this into four different languages. And what comes back is this. So it says, I'm pretty sure this is English. In fact, I'm confident this has to be what it is. So, so the confidence score instead of being like 0.99 is, is one. And then it's translated in theory into Polish, German, Italian, and believe it or not, Klingon is the fourth one. So, so if you're a Star Trek fan, there's a little something for you. Um, I speak a little bit of German. I know the German's right. I'll leave it to the rest of you to know if the Polish is right. And if we have any, any Italian speakers, I hope that's right. And if there are Klingon speakers, I will take, take your word for it. But that is actually a supported language, believe it or not. So quickly, how did this work? Um, I'm not a C-sharp dev. Uh, you, you know, there's plenty of code laying around that attests to that. 